told that this beam is such that its center line does not really coincide with its cross section normal, isn't it? So that's why this. So we allow for that. So for example, if this is the center line tangent, then the cross section could be like this. So they do not make 90 degree angle between them. Okay. So similarly over here, we could have something like this, and the cross section could be. Construct your full beam. Okay, so, and then we said that, see, initially the cross section was vertical, right, and so it's normal. This is the cross section normal. So that's the cross section normal. <coughs> so initially the normal was horizontal and then it has rotated. And since it has rotated in a negative sen sense, so the angle of rotation is therefore negative theta, right? And if I look at the center line tangent, then it has also undergone rotation, and that's the horizontal line. And this angle, assuming it is very small, then this becomes dy by dx. Otherwise, this tangent was dy by dx. Okay, and so when we look at these two lines, maybe I can make them thicker. So this is the cross section. So then we see that uh, this, the, the shear we found out was uh, gamma equal to dy by dx minus theta. Right, so that implies dy by dx was equal to gamma plus theta. So you see that the slope, the rotation of the slope has got contribution from two terms. The first term, sorry, this theta, which is the second term, is the rotation due to cross sections rotation, which we also call you know, due to bending. So this is due to bending. We will see why we call this due to bending. Whereas the gamma, that's also rotation due to shear. Okay? So this is already, and then we wrote gamma in terms of Shear force and it turned out to be dy by dx is equal to shear force V of x divided by the correction factor kappa k, sorry, correction factor k, g a plus theta. So that's the first equation of Timo Senko beam theory. So we have two unknowns, y and theta, and this is the first equation. And obviously we need one more equation. 
and I just wrote down the other equation would be EI d theta by dx is equal to m of x depending moment. But then I have posed the question why is this d theta by dx, why not d2 by dx2? Because we all have this in our mind that EI times curvature is bending moment, right? Mm -hmm. And curvature somehow appears as if it is t2 over dx2. So we'll see why we are saying this is d theta by dx and why not d2 over dx2. So let's just look at that. So I work out a very simple situation. So think of pure bending of a beam. So here's a pure beam and it undergoes pure bending. So there will be a center somewhere. Okay. So that's the center of the rotation. And this line is your neutral line, isn't it? So, we call the radius of the neutral line as capital R. And let us suppose this angle is theta. Okay? Is it okay? Maybe I should have solid line only. That's okay. Um, okay, and then we know that the neutral line does not undergo any stretching or compression. That implies that R theta is equal to L. Right? Mm -hmm. So, theta by L is equal to R. One by R, okay. Yes, it is one by R. Okay. Um, and then, if you want to know what's the strain, normal strain in different fibers of the beam, what do we do? We simply let us, for example, set up our coordinate system. That's x. And let's call it y. So if we are at a distance y ever, then the the fiber, what's the length of that fiber? That's simply r minus y times theta. Right, because it isn't bent into a perfect circle. So if I go distance y ever, the radius is r minus y, so this that length would be r minus y times this theta. But before bending, that length was r times theta, same as the length of the neutral line. So, what's the strain? Epsilon excess. That's going to be the form length minus the original length divided by original length. So that's something we have all seen. This becomes minus y over r. Then you can get sigma xx, which is minus e times y over r. And then you compute the bending moment, right? And the bending moment simply turns out to be you compute over the integrate over the cross section, which is y times sigma x to dA. And 
you get it to be E i 1 over R. Right? So something we have learned from our strength of materials course. Now let's, so here, what you see here is that this 1 by R, which is curvature, is really the curvature of the center line or the neutral line. So everything makes perfect sense as we have been doing. The bending moment is EI times the curvature, where curvature is that of the center line. Isn't it? Now let's do something else. Um, let's compress our beam also. Okay. I, I think, do, do we need to minus sun there in the last um, equation? Since we so J is cutting outward. The sigma x i has a minus. And then we have. Well, as you. So bending moment, the epsilon axis as you go up is negative. So stress. Sigma axis is also negative, compressing, pointing in that direction, mm -hmm. but the moment is positive. The moment due to that is positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. Yes. Okay, so that's your bending moment. And all right, so let's let's do another experiment. Now I'm going to also compress the beam. So that was your R. So this time I'm going to compress my beam. that the radius now is a smaller. Okay, so what's the curvature of the beam now? What do you think? So <coughs> right now again the beam is bent into a circle and the radius is smaller so curvature is 1 by R, curvature of the center line. Right? So, so in this case, curvature kappa is now 1 by r. So what do you think, what will be the bending moment? Is that going to be ei times 1 by small r? Or bending moment remains the same? So let's figure out. So in this particular situation, so we now want to talk about this situation. So again, we set up our coordinate system over here, and we go a distance y above the neutral line. So, what's your epsilon axis? As you go above a y distance above the neutral line, what's the length of the fiber? That's the small r minus y times theta. That's a deformed length, right? Mm -hmm. You see that theta, I'm keeping it to be the same as earlier. So that's a deformed length. What is its undeformed length? Capital, capital R theta, right? It's not small r theta, it's capital R theta. Mm -hmm. Then we divide by capital R theta. and see what you get. So that's small r minus capital R over capital R minus y by r. So what you see here, it's a, it does not change with y. So it's a constant in the cross section. It is a constant term. And then you have your 
family here, some that you have earlier. Okay, so you could write it as some epsilon minus y by r. And this is actually the axial strain of the neutral axis, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So that's the axial strain of the neutral axis. So it's like axial straining. So you have a beam and you have stressed it. That's why this one comes. And this is the, again, your bending strain. OK? So now if I want to get what is sigma xx, that's simply e times epsilon minus y over r. And then if I want to get my bending moment, m of x, that's going to be negative y sigma xx dA. So it has got two terms. The first term is a constant term, so that is minus y e epsilon dA plus <coughs> 1 over r e y square dA. And you see, these are constants. Maybe I should have put it outside, but let's keep it as it is now. So that's minus e epsilon integral y dA plus e i 1 by r. So you see, what is, what's the first term equal to? Integral y dA. So that's the centroid of the cross section. But you are choosing a y from the centroid itself. So that's 0. Right? And what you see is that your bending moment has not changed. So whatever was the bending moment in this case, you have the same bending moment even now. But what we are thinking is the bending moment should have been e i times 1 over small r. But this is still e i times 1 over capital R. Right? And this is also, you could write as e i times theta by L. Right? You see your r theta is equal to L. <coughs> e i times theta by L. And if you allow me, I'll also write it as EI theta prime. Can I write that? You see, that's what I wrote here. Okay? So you see, whenever there is bending, there has to be change in rotation of the cross section. <coughs> Only then, see, there is, so let's think of this. Um, there is a beam. There is one cross section over here. There is another cross section over here. Two cross sections. If there is change in orientation, only then one side is going to come place, and the other side is going to stretch and only then you will have some resultant moment right if it just does this there won't be any resultant moment right okay so I hope you're convinced now that this is what it should be You have a question? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it turns out. So okay. So this this is your Timoshenko equation. The two equations of Timoshenko beam theory. You will see at many places they will combine these two into a single equation. You can do that also. 
you know, you take the differentiation, for example, you differentiate it here, d by dx2 equal to dv by dx over kappa ga plus d theta by dx. And then you plug in your d theta by dx from here, over here. And then you get a single equation. Okay? So let's just uh, have a relook at these two equations and see finally what approximations have we really applied here. If I talk of the first equation, can you tell me what are the approximations involved? If we now think from nonlinear continuum mechanics point of view, think of all sorts of deformations that can happen. Restrict just to the planar case. And then think about large deformations. Then what do you think? What are the approximations involved here? Shape of this cross section? Sure. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, it's, that's certainly true, yes. But you know, in this theory, cross section, we just average the cross section. So there's something more important here. That's, of course, true. Rotation? Rotation of cross section. Yes, of course, that's there, right? Theta? Theta is more in rotation and cross section. Okay. Our initial, initial assumption of curvature dy by dx is small. That is one approximation we initially made and then we continued. Yes, so our initial assumption of dy by dx, which is slope, not curvature. Mm -hmm. Slope mm -hmm. being small. Mm -hmm. If that were not the case, what you should have written here? Ten inverse two over So that's uh, so you already have an, a very big assumption over here, right? So this should have been ten inverse two over here. So that's the most important uh, distinction. If you compare this with the non-linear theory that we, will, that we will be discussing later on, which allows for large rotation of the cross-section. So this is the most distinct assumption, most distinct, and um, the biggest distinction between the two theories. And of course, there are things like, why do we assume linearity? Why is uh, EI, d theta by dx, proportional to movement? Why not there is a non-linear function? So for example, we say that sigma xx is simply p times epsilon xx. So that's, we are talking about linear material law. What if the deformations are large and you go into non-linear material, non-linearity regime? Right, so, so this relation will then be non-linear. So here you have material linearity. And same way over here also. But you said that shear strain is proportional to shear force. So at these two plus places, you have the assumption of material linearity. Somehow, you know, we can always neglect this as far as one dimensional beams are concerned. The strains, the curvature, or let's just call it theta prime, and the shear strain here are usually small, are usually small enough so that you can, you're safe with this assumption. But this is the one which 
does not fold. As you saw, right, you had a beam, you could do whatever you want. So theta is really large. All right, so that's what you must do in theory. So let's do one simple example. Again, your cantilever case, but using Timo simple. So we already did it using Euler Bernoulli, but we want to do it now using the motion going theory. So, so here we have how many boundary conditions do you think we need? So we have two equations, right? Each of them are first order in the unknowns, isn't it? So if I just look at the order of differentiation, you need two boundary conditions. You have two unknowns, and each of them are first order, so one plus one, two boundary conditions. Provided you would be able to completely find out shear force and bending moment throughout the beam. If there are some extra unknowns in shear force and bending moment, then you get extra, you, you need extra boundary conditions. Okay. So let's just uh, think of this situation and tell me, can you tell me what would be the boundary condition that we can use? For example, if I look at the clamped end, what do you think is the boundary condition? So you have two unknowns, y and theta. Theta is zero. Dy over dx. Dy over dx is zero. And it's clamped. Okay, so y at 0 is equal to 0. That's one. And the other one, you are saying dy by dx at 0 is equal to 0. What do you think? Is that correct? What is dy by dx? That's a slope. As the beam deforms, it could become like this. So that's a slope, you see. Because we are not allowed to shear. So this is not correct. So this is what differentiates T motion and Gotham Euler. Okay, so instead of this, we want to have theta of zero equal to zero. Because theta is the cross-section rotation, and you see the whole cross-section is clamped. It can't rotate. So this is correct. Theta of zero equal to zero. Okay, so we have those two boundary conditions. Now let's try to find out the shear force diagram, for example. What will be V of x? at any point in the beam. Because the strength of material force, you have a constant P acting, there is no distributed load. So V of X is same as P, right? Constant P. Mm -hmm. What about M of X? Just as we did last time. Mm -hmm. And it would be P times L minus X. Okay, so we can now plug them in those equations. If I solve, for example, the second equation, then d theta by dx is equal to p times l minus x over ei. And then you integrate this and you get theta of x is equal to p over ei times L of x minus x squared by 2 plus some constant c. 
But then when you say theta of zero is equal to zero, so this goes away. <coughs> so that's your theta. Now you plug your theta in the first equation, and then you get dy by ds is equal to p over kga plus theta, which is over here. So p over ei into l of x minus x squared by 2. And then you integrate, and you get y of x is equal to px over kga plus p over ei into l of x squared by 2 minus x cubed by 6 and that's another constant. Right, very simple. Then you apply y of 0 is equal to 0. And this goes away. So that's your y of x. If I want to write it slightly in a slightly modified fashion, you could so write it as px over kga plus plq over 2ei. times x, x over L for the square minus 1 over 3 of x over L whole cube. So you remember what you got for the Euler? We saw the same problem using Euler Bernoulli theory. Mm -hmm. How does it look different from the Euler theory? Sure. Presence of the first term, right? So that's the contribution of shear. Now the question would be, which one to use and when to use? When to use Euler and when to use Timoshenko in theory? So maybe you can, one of the easiest way to do that would be um, Why don't we subtract the two and look at how much is the error? Right, so error um, which we could denote as uh, what should I use? Um. <laughs> <laughs> so we get silent R for error. So that's Y due to Euler. Okay, let's make it Y due to Timoshenko minus y due to Euler divided by y due to Euler. Let's do it at the point where we'll have maximum error. And that will be at the tip. Okay, so let's find it out at L. So on the numerator, when we did subtract the two, we'll have just this term, right? Because this is the same as it was earlier. So on numerator, you have E L over K G A. And on denominator, when you put x equal to L, this term, the Euler deflection becomes P L cube over 3 i. I think all of us must be remembering that. The fraction of a cantilever is simply PLQ over 3 here. So we could write it. You don't have to remember. PLQ over 3 EI. So that's your relative error, right? So this is equal to Um, P L square so three E I three E 
keep i over k g a l square. Okay. Um, now maybe we may want to use, let's say, the rectangular beam, for example. Let's do it for rectangular beam. Then what is I equal to? B H Q by 12, right? 1 over 12 B H Q, where B is the width, H is the height. So the cross section, you have rectangular beam. This is your width, which is B. And that's your height, H. So second moment of area I, <coughs> the rectangular beam, is B H Q over 12. And area is simply B times H. So let's have a look at, again, your ER, epsilon R. So that's equal to T E B H cube over 12 divided by K G B H L square. You see this B goes away, this H goes away and it becomes square. So this is equal to um, <coughs> 1 over 4 E by KG times h by l squared. Okay, so that's very interesting. What is so interesting about this? So what we have over here, this is the property of the material, b by kg. And this is the geometry of the beam. Slenderness ratio, H by L. Right? So what do you think? When would be epsilon R very small? Yeah? Very thin beam. Very thin beam, right? Where H by L is very small, isn't it? So if you have a very slender beam, long, compared to its lateral dimension, this number would be very small. For example, your length is 10 meters, and h is 1 meters, so h value is 0.1, and this is about 0 0.01. So who cares about 0 0.01? They think that is 0 0.01. But mechanics people care, but engineers, engineers do not care, right? <laughs> so, so now you see, right? So, uh, when to use oil and when to use Shimoshenko. And of course, you know, this ratio, for example, if you have an isotropic beam, then it's like some constant. But often you have nano beams where this ratio could also be either very small or could be very large. And then it starts influencing, so the product gets influenced, right, because of this number. So that's why this is also important. You can't always neglect this. Okay, so here is, we have a problem in which this length is big L, the length of the beam. One end of the beam is clamped, and on the other end, it is pinned here. 
So it can go up and down. But it's not allowed to axially displace. It's also not allowed to rotate here, right? Because the whole cross section is constrained due to this bar. But it can go up and down freely, there's no friction. So we then apply a force P here. Okay? Okay, the force P acting. Now let's talk about solving this problem. Let's say using the motion going theory. So what are the boundary conditions, for example? On the clamp end, it's the same boundary condition, right? As we had earlier, so we could write y of 0 is equal to 0, and theta of 0 is equal to 0. Then about the shear force, v of x, what will be v of x? <coughs> so I'm applying the load p here. So how will shear force vary? Is this right end allowed to move horizontally? No, it can't move horizontally. It can or cannot? It cannot. It cannot. Yes. Because it is, uh, is you know, we have got like a pipe which is attached to this beam at the end and then we just put that pipe within this. So it can't go, it can't move actually. Okay, so what do you think? What's the shear force diagram? What will be v of, v of x equal to? Yes? P. P. Okay. What about m of x? P into P into L minus X. Okay, anyone has a different opinion? No? So maybe we should draw a three body diagram. It's always good to draw a three body diagram, right? So let's draw it over here. So let's talk about the clamped case, for example. So at the clamped end, this end cannot move vertically. And you remember the table, if displacement is constrained, then there is some force, unknown force. So there is some force here. It can also not move axially. So there will be some force. It cannot rotate. So there is some bending moment. Come to this end. It can move freely up and down. And the force is prescribed. So that becomes known to you. That force is known. It cannot move axially, so there is axial constraint. So what about axial reaction, horizontal reaction? There will be some horizontal reaction, right? So let's call that R. It cannot rotate here. Then? Reaction moment, right? So, and not. Then let's think of drawing our 
getting the shear force at bending moment, let's suppose at any section over here, which is at a distance x. So we isolate that section. And then again draw the free body diagram. Here you have R, then you have P, and then you have M naught. And over here, you have the shear force V of X. There will be some axial force also to balance this, which is going to be the same as R. And of course, Vx also becomes the same as P. So all that comes by you know, applying the force balance. And then you have your M of X. So what you see is that V of X equal to P, this is correct. What about M of X? What do we do about that? So for example, if we do moment balance about this point, what do we get? We do moment balance about this point then we have this m of x clockwise, so it comes to the minus sign, minus m of x, plus this m naught, and due to p, plus p times m minus x, and Anything else? Okay. These two points are not at the same vertical height. The deflection here is y of x, that deflection over there is y of l. So there's a difference between the deflection. That's going to generate moment due to this reaction r also. Right? <laughs> wondering whether you include that or not. Yes. Of course we have to include. Well, if you assume small deformations, then of course you don't include that. No? Because then you write equilibrium at the undeformed thing. Yeah. So this brings so the geometrical non-linearity. So this brings in, so because I'm building up for the <laughs> Cosra draw, <drugs>, so... <laughs> I see where you're, you're driving to. Yeah. Just R times y of L minus y of x. So Professor Simon is right that you know if the deflections are very small, then the axial reaction usually is ignored. But you know, let's suppose that deflection is large, then that also comes in. Okay, so what is then M of X? So this is definitely not correct. And M of X is equal to M naught plus P times L minus X plus R times Y of L minus Y of X. Okay, so what do you think? What are the unknowns here? So you got two boundary conditions which are good enough for your two orders of differentiation. But then you have extra unknowns. This is one unknown. That's another unknown. Two more unknowns. So can you figure out two more boundary conditions? Of course, we have exhausted the clamp and we have to look for the other end. <coughs> theta at the end of the beam is also zero. Right. Theta of L is equal to zero. Okay. Very good.
Anything else? Nothing really. You could say that why don't we say that the axial displacement at the other end is zero, right? Because that's what is generating this unknown. So we might want to say that the axial displacement at the other end is zero. So I just write it. We don't have any variables for that as of now. So axial displacement. at L equal to 0. But we don't have this variable in our system of equations. <coughs> so we won't be able to use this boundary condition. So we can't use, cannot use. And there are no other boundary conditions which we can use to solve this. So you cannot solve it with either oil or motion code. You know, sometimes you will see the motion code being theory where the axial displacement is also as an extra unknown. So of course, so if you use that to motion code theory where the unknowns are cross section rotation, vertical deflection, as well as horizontal displacement, then you can solve this. <coughs> But the theory that we learned here, in which we only had vertical deflections and the cross-section rotations as unknown, we can't use that theory to solve this. Yeah? Yeah. As long as we include this last term, right. then only we have this problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Keeping that aside also, what were, I mean, you see the most important limitation is that dy by dx has to be small, right? So that's something we are very bothered about and we want to relax that. So, so we have to do what's called theory of plastic rods. Okay. Okay. So let's start our new topic: theory of special cross rod rods. Here you have two words, spatial, cross rod. So why it is spatial, why it is cross rod? So I'll tell you about it as we proceed. But for now, you just think of that we are going to learn a theory in which we will also take care of the large rotations. Okay? If you want, you could just say theory of elastic rods. Okay, so again we have our old picture. So we have a beam which is straight in its reference state. This axis as E3. Okay, so it comes with a tilde E3. So this is slightly different than in our usual beam theory. The axis was x axis. The time calling it the E3 axis, the z axis is your axis. 
and then you can have x here or let's say e1 and that's your e2 okay so that's your beam in the reference state and then it gets deformed <coughs> We are not going to have any assumption that the rotations are small or anything. So if that's the case, so as we said earlier, we want to have a 1D theory. So we have to model how the center line finally looks like and also the orientation of the cross section. Because you saw that in Timoshenko beam theory, that just the center line does not dictate the cross section. And since we want to talk about a general beam theory, so then we have to have both of them modeled separately, independently. Okay? So in this theory, we have center line small r. So let us say this is your cross section at a coordinate S. So this point, the centroid of that cross section is S E3. Okay? And this cross section, once the beam has deformed, <coughs> suppose it is here. And that's the centroid. And the position vector of the deformed centroid that we denote by small r of s. Okay? And for the orientation of the cross section, you see now the beam can actually deform in the general three dimensional space. Earlier we were restricting it to just planar deformation. Now we want it to deform in the whole three dimensional space. So to model that orientation of the cross section, we will have also a rotation tensor, big R of S. Okay, so the unknowns here, so this is the kinematics of the, the elastic rod. So we are talking about kinematics. So we want to know what variables we are going to use to describe our B. So the unknowns here are small r of s and the rotation, big R of s. And as it can deform in the 3D space, a small r has got three components, r1, r2, r3. So we want to allow, we want to allow axial displacement, we want to allow transfer displacement in both directions, one as well as two, and of course axial also. So we have R1, R2, R3. Compare this with the Timoshenko or Euler. We, we just had Y. So here we have all the three, R1, R2, R3. And in rotation, the rotation is not just about the E2 axis as we had there. So in Euler or Timoshenko, we had rotation of only about one axis, right? Because it was deforming in a plane. But over here, it could rotate either about one axis or two axis or three axis. For example, you have you see this beam. What will you call if it rotates about three axis? If the beam rotates about three axis, about the E3 axis. 
it. What will you call that? Yes? Torsion, right? So it's a torsion of a beam. So one end is clamped and other end is rotating, so you have a gradual rotation, increase in rotation. So that's the torsion of a beam. If it is rotating about E2 axis, so it then becomes like this. So that's the bending about E2 axis. If it rotates about E1 axis, it becomes like this. So that's bending about E1 axis. And you can have rotations about all three axes together also. Because we want to model general deformation. Okay, so that's something we capture through this variable big R, a rotation tensor. So this is for center line position, center line position. And that's for the orientation of the cross section. Okay. Um, we also have the concept of what's called directors in this theory. Okay? So the directors are in the cross section, they remain in the cross section. So we can have two directors here. I hope you can see it. So if you have, if you know the two directors, you would know the plane of the cross section, right? So those two directors remain in the cross section plane. So if you know the directors, you can define the plane of the cross section. Okay. Now, let me write down what's called the constrained kinematics yeah. or constrained deformation map. And we'll try to understand what is that. So, we, so as we know, deformation map is F of capital X coming from 3D elasticity. And let me just write down and I'll explain what is that. F of capital X is also, you could write as F of X1, comma, X2, comma, X3. But that's S. Okay, so this is called the constrained deformation map of elastic rod. So let's try to understand this. So we have deformation of F for any general point capital X, which could be over here. Let's say it is here, somewhere here. Capital X is equal to x1 comma x2 comma s 
to you. Its EC coordinate is S because this point is in this cross section. And what does this map tell us? Let's put x alpha, x1, x2 equal to 0. What do we get? If I put x1, x2 equal to 0, then f of a small s is equal to simply small r of s. So x1, x2 equal to 0 means I'm talking about the center line. And then this map tells us that center line goes to small r of s. Okay? So once center line is done, then think of the cross section, any point in the cross section of the rod. So now x1, x2 is not 0, it is something. And what is this modeling? x alpha d alpha. The local coordinates on the cross section. Yeah. Maybe I can draw the figure. So suppose this is the cross section, and that's the centroid. And here is your E1 axis, and that's your E2 axis. And once the cross section deforms, it might become something like this. Let us suppose. So the centroid of the cross section. We know from here it goes to small r of s. So this point is the small r of s. And any other point over here, so this is x1 and that's x2. So that's your x1, x2 point in the cross section. Where does it go using this map? So first we have to draw your d1 and d2. So maybe d1 is somewhere over here. And d2 is somewhere over here. And what you have to do is, you see, x1 d1 plus x2 d2. So you have one vector, x1 d1 plus x2 d2. And then it's resultant. Okay, I hope. So what we see here is that D1 and D2, they define the cross-section plane and then you can know where does any other point of the cross-section go. Okay. Um, and why is this constrained kinematics? Can you think of it? Why it is called constrained kinematics? Yeah, the other thing is this cross section can at most be planar. Plane section remains plane, right? So this only allows the cross section to remain planar. So plane section remains plane. Also the shape of the cross section, if it is initially circular, 
it can at most change into an ellipse. It cannot become something like this. Don't you need extra degrees of freedom for that? Extend the rotation? For becoming an ellipse? Yeah, like stress. Yes, so, okay, yes. So, the directors are no more orthonormal. So, D1, D2. I'm not saying that they are orthonormal. For example, if, let's say, D2 is E2, so D2 is unit norm, and D1 is not unit norm, then the cross section is actually going to stretch in the D1 direction, because it's simply X1, D1. I'm just curious how the Ds are mapped from... Yeah, right, so Ds. that's something we'll, we have to talk about. We'll talk about that. So the directors, I haven't said that they are unit norm. Okay, although E1, E2, you see here, they are unit norm and perpendicular to each other, but the directors D1, D2, as of now, they are just defining the plane of the cross-section, and they need not be unit norm. So what happens if your D1, for example, is not unit norm? Let's say it is one point, its magnitude is 1.1, but D2 is unit norm, its magnitude is 1 and they are perpendicular to each other. So you see the cross section is then going to stretch along the D1 direction. Because it's simply x1 times G1. Right? Similarly, if you let D2 change its magnitude, you can let the cross section stretch in D2 direction. And if you let the rotation, the angle between D1 and D2 not be 90 degree, then you can somehow allow what's shearing within the cross-sectional plane. Because two perpendicular lines are no more perpendicular. The initial perpendicular lines, they will no more be perpendicular. So for example, you, you take any line here, this line for example, yeah, I can use different color. So this line, that's going to go over here. Because this line has x2 equal to 0. So you put x2 equal to 0. It is simply x1, d1. So that goes here. Then I think of this line, and that goes over here. And if the angle between D1 and D2 is not 90 degree, then you can see that two perpendicular lines are no more perpendicular. So it generates <coughs> shearing. And if I think of any arbitrary line over here, where does that go? What does ha what happens to that? That will still remain a line, but it will of course have some other orientation. So a line remains a line, according to this map. Cross-sectional plane is plane. And the line also remains a line. Okay, so that's um, so this kinematics is used in what's called Cossarat rod theory. And what is a special Cossarat rod? So of course it's a special theory. Because now we assume that the directors are unit norms and the angle between them is also 90 degrees. So that's why you call it a spatial cosmic plot. 
Okay, so for spatial cost we have got D one, D two are orthogonal and unit norm. And you can also now think of D3 such that it is perpendicular to both D1 and D2. And that will be perpendicular to your cross section. Okay, so D3, so you can now think of D3 perpendicular to cross section. So D1, D2, and D3, they now form your local coordinate system. So it's an orthonormal triad and it forms what's called the local coordinate system in the deformed configuration. Okay? So maybe we'll start from here next time. So we'll, so now that the D1, D2, D3 are unit norm, we'll think of how can they be mapped from E1, E2, E3. And that's where this rotation tensor will come in picture. One set of orthonormal triad, E1, E2, E3, getting mapped into another set of orthonormal triad, D1, D2, D3. So you can always find a rotation tensor mapping two different orthonormal triads. 